All right. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you could join us for Sunday worship today. Uh, if you're new or visiting, we want to welcome you. My name is Sam. I am part of the pastoral staff and want to welcome you to our church. Again, a lot of exciting things happening. This is typically the time of the year where our church kind of kicks off, community groups resume, a lot of exciting activities heading into the holiday season. So rarely a good time to come uh, for more reasons than one. Shout out again to all the college students. I'm sure you're either checking out churches and you're settling into college back again. And so we want to welcome you. Just know we have a huge heart for college at our church Pastor Tom, myself, and now uh, Brother Daniel Shim, all of us have been involved with college ministry in a very particular way over the course of, what, almost two decades now. So we love college students. We're so glad you could join us. And hopefully, if you have any other questions, you can ask uh, any of us, or particularly uh, College Director Shim. Uh, if you're new or visiting, again, welcoming lunch next week is probably the easiest and greatest opportunity to get plugged in in a more smaller and intimate way, and also to get some Free food, meet other people who are visiting the church, and more importantly, know how to get plugged in. So highly encourage you to sign up for that if that's something that you are interested in taking part of. But more importantly, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, it's a particularly good time to visit because we started a new short series last week that we've never done before, which is what we're calling a vision series. And basically, if you're curious, basically for the past few years, Grace Hill Church, pretty much from 2020 till now, the goal of our church was simply to be healthy and the way we defined that was to lay a foundation and a structure that can really be strong for our church. So that was everything from establishing membership to creating and drafting foundational documents to kind of finding our footing as a church. And kind of a pseudo end of that journey, not to say we're not going to be healthy moving forward, but kind of an end to that journey was uh, establishing elders and leadership, which you've been at our church. That's something we were able to do by God's grace a couple months ago. And after that moment, and since that moment, Pastor Tom, Elder Vince, and myself, the three elders, we've been pretty much praying from nonstop, discussing and thinking through a vision and conviction that we shared regarding how does God want to lead our church, right? Because in one sense, elders, we care for you, we pray for you, we shepherd you. But in another sense, we're also leading the church, right? We're trying to discern where does God want to take our church? Because God forbid a church just exists to survive, right? Like we're wasting our time then, right? There's better means to find community than a church. But the church should be on mission. There should be a goal. There should be where are we headed. And we feel the burden as elders. Let's clarify that vision first, for, first and foremost by sitting in God's presence. And then how do we communicate that to the church? And so last week we heard it summed up in this word and idea of discipleship. The way that we're kind of saying is we want to raise the bar across the board for the church, not to make things more difficult, but because we really believe if you really want to follow Jesus in a meaningful way, you kind of do need to raise the bar. And so we're trying to preach through the word to show you this is not a construct of man. This is literally how Jesus describes what it means to follow him. I have the privilege of saying part two today. And then next week, actually, Elder Vince will be preaching to close it out for the first time ever. So please pray for him as he gets ready to close out the series next week. But for today, the text we're going to be looking at is Matthew chapter 4, verse 17 to 22 in the ESV. So if you have it in your programs or your Bibles, please turn there. And as we turn there, let's all rise together as here at our church. We believe that God's word is living and active, and he's speaking through it today through the Spirit. Matthew chapter 4, starting from verse 17 in the ESV, this is the reading of God's word. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. It's the reading of God's word. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we do ask that particularly as a church, we'd be open uh, and undistracted in our receptiveness to the word you would have for us today through your living and powerful and active word. May your spirit speak in a way that convicts, transforms, and helps us, God, to really hear a message that we need to hear. So we thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So again, obviously today's message is a little different than the typical Sunday. It's more a, a vision that we're trying to cast and we're trying to communicate to the church and every now and then, I'd say this happens maybe once or twice a year, I have a particular burden where I really want to get the message across. So just know, uh, if you've seen me any number of times, some messages, I, I'm a little bit more amped than usual. I think today's going to be one of those messages. So giving you a heads up in particular. And the reason is because I have been praying and, and, and thinking about discipleship 
in the context of our church for a very, very long time. Okay, a very, very long time. And this is kind of the product of me trying to shave and cut and figure out how am I going to communicate what I feel is this burden God has given to me and our elders to the church. And in the midst of thinking about it, there was a few general observations that I made regarding our church context in particular to kind of ground this message so you understand where I'm coming from. Number one, I do think most of us are familiar with the idea of discipleship in the sense that Christianity involves some version of following Jesus and obeying his commands. I think even if you're not a Christian, if you kind of live in this context, you kind of get that, okay? So there's a baseline there. In fact, when we say discipleship, I'm sure it's not a new concept or idea to you. So that's one. Two, I actually think a lot of us are even familiar with texts like the one we just read, which paints this picture of a radical call, right? Like discipleship and following Jesus means you drop everything or you sell all your belongings or the intense one, you hate your family. And I'm sure we've heard messages like that where like, oh, this discipleship is like this intense thing based off of some of the stuff you've heard about it. But three, I think, and to give the benefit of that, I don't think this is true of all churches, but I do think at our church, most of us have a deep down desire to want to follow Jesus. And I praise God for that. Right? I don't think that's the case for all, the, all churches or all people. Now, some of us don't, and that's a different issue. For the most part, though, deep down inside, I think more of us either are loving Jesus or we want to know more about Jesus. We'd like to be more intimate with him. And with those observations in mind, I think what the motive for this message is, I still think, though, a lot of us have a hard time actually following Jesus, ignoring what it looks like practically given our context. Okay? So we kind of know what it is. We want to do it, but we still have a hard time doing it. And the conclusion I made of why that is the case is I think following Jesus is tough for a lot of us because if we're to be honest, it seems very out of touch with our day-to-day reality, does it not? Like it's nice to go to a retreat or like a secluded mountaintop and feel convicted and be on fire for God. That's usually when those messages like sell everything, you know, like give it all up, like go to the nations, love the poor. And you're like, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And like, I'm only going to think about Jesus. We're like weeping. And then the moment you come down, it's like, that's up there. This is down here. And is that not kind of the rhythm of the Christian life that a lot of us experience? Like discipleship, it's in these like privatized mountaintop moments. But when you go back to school, there's family drama, parenting, working, just trying to get by. Doesn't that kind of like rub against the seemingly impossible call that you just heard at that retreat or that mission trip? And you do that enough times. It's just this kind of like jarring thing. It's like, I know what discipleship is. I really want to do it. But I just, it doesn't make sense with my reality. This is where I think our text today helps shape and probably correct maybe a misunderstanding of discipleship, which prevents us from actually seeing it as something that has day-to-day real implications. So in light of that, I'm going to share three truths about discipleship from this text that I think speak directly to our context and tie directly to our vision for this year, and then I'll speak a few applications for our church. The first truth is this, Jesus calls us as we are. Jesus calls us as we are. The first thing to note in this text to lay a groundwork is this. Notice this. Jesus, he is the one who is seeking his disciples. I think a lot of us think that discipleship is motivated by our desire to want to follow Jesus and obey Jesus. And don't get me wrong, that's not necessarily wrong, but that is not the start of Christian discipleship. Because in this text, Jesus is the one who is seeking out relationship with the disciples. And just know that would have been very weird in that context. You know why? In that context, rabbis were these holier-than-thou, larger-than-life figures, and people would seek out the rabbis. Understandable, right? They would want to be their disciples. They would want to be like, please choose me. I want to be worthy. And yet in this story, looking at verse 18, these brothers that Jesus is about to call, they're not seeking Jesus at all. They're just doing their thing. And it makes it a pain to say, Jesus is the one walking, he's the one seeking, he's the one seeing. And that's a helpful reminder to us to understand that Christian discipleship at its core, it's predicated on a savior who came to seek and save the lost. Just understand, if you're exploring Christianity, that is the starting point and entrance. Before we did anything, Jesus sought us out. And even today, he seeks us out. So what that means, a reminder for you, Christian, when you come on a Sunday, God's not like, I guess you got to prove yourself. He's saying, I've been waiting. I've been seeing you all week. 
I've been seeking you out all week. Let's meet. It's a very different posture to start, which leads to this very important observation. In doing that, Jesus calls us as we are, where we are. Now, this truth is very important for us to really digest because a lot of us, one big barrier to following Jesus, if we're honest, is that we are too busy. Um, I've never heard this statement more used than in our context, which is, how are you doing? It's a busy season. It's a busy season. In other words, I've never heard that not be said, so I have created a, a Grace Hill synonym. Season means life. <laughs> It's a busy life. Like, tell me this. When has it not been a busy season? When has it not been a busy season? Really think about that. So that's one barrier. The other barrier is I don't feel wor- worthy or I don't feel qualified. Like, following Jesus, I don't have either time for that or, man, do you know me? Do you know my history? Or do you know the kinds of things that's going on in my head and my heart? I don't think you understand who you're talking to. So that's so important to note. Number one, Jesus literally sees and calls his first disciples in the middle of the busyness of their lives. Jesus is the king of kings. He could realize, hey, they're casting a net right now. How about you wait till they're done fishing and then say, now that you're done fishing, follow me. Why literally in the midst of them throwing out their nets does he say, hey, follow me? Like, don't you think he's trying to communicate something, not just in the call, but in the timing of the call? That would be the equivalent of Jesus waiting till you're in the middle of your work meeting and say, dung, 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 hey, can you follow me? It'd be in the middle of you changing a diaper and Jesus saying, hey, can you follow me? Like, what's up with this terrible timing? In other words, the very context of the call to discipleship communicates Jesus intends to meet you in the middle of the chaos of your life. Not in the peripheries, which a lot of Christian culture has done, which is what's the peripheries? Mission trips, mountaintop retreats. So if you think discipleship is for the peripheries of your life and not the real life, you're always going to feel like following Jesus is for secluded moments. It's not for my Monday to Saturday. And that creates this warped, out-of-touch understanding that we're not being good disciples because discipleship looks and feels like that, and I can't do that in my day-to-day life. Second, look who Jesus is calling. I know naturally we don't think much of the fact that he's calling fishermen. It's like, oh, big deal. But any reasonable Jew would have scratched their heads because Jesus' choice of disciples is very, very strange. It'd be like an NBA GM manager going straight to third round and saying, like, this is where I want my cream of the crop. This is where I want my pick. You know why? Because in first century Judaism, rabbis, this is basically what they would do. They would go to the cream of the crop. So they wouldn't go to, like, the junior college of Judaism. No no offense to junior college. It's a great financial decision. I think more should consider it. But they wouldn't go there. They would go to the Harvard of Judaism, top of the top. They get the 100 best students, and that they would see their grades. They would see their skill. They would see their competency. And out of the 100, they would pick the top 10, and they say, you will be my Talmudim. You will be my disciples. The 90 that don't make the cut, sent home, didn't make the cut. Now you just do the family business. That's who they pick, and it makes sense if you really think about it. So if there's 100 Jewish students, the rabbi would see the brightest, smartest ones, and the rest would be sent home. So it's very strange that Jesus' first choice of disciples were objectively not the greatest, not the smartest, not the most qualified of the bunch. They were, by definition, second tier, below average people that were passed on. In fact, all the more commercial fishermen were the epitome of blue collar back in the day, not really seen as high and esteemed in society. And in fact, later even in the New Testament, we see in Acts 4.13, literally people are confused by Jesus' disciples because they call them uneducated and untrained men. It's like, oh my goodness, Jesus' disciples are like, they're not the Harvards, they're like the dropouts, like what's going on? So if you, are, if you feel uneducated or untrained, Disciple, your disciple material. Now, how does this apply to us today? The reality that Jesus calls us where we are and as we are should have a dual effect on our hearts. It should both comfort and convict us at the same time. And just know the razor sharp, two edgedness of the scripture should always do that if it's working correctly. The gospel should kill you in your flesh and sin, and it should resurrect you by grace and mercy. That's every Sunday, that's what we hope to do. To convict you, but also to comfort you. 
If you have one too much over the other, you have a warped understanding of who Jesus is and what he's trying to do in your life. So this dual effect, how does that apply? First, it should convict us because what this means is there is no context too busy, no person too unworthy, and no situation that is off limits when it comes to Jesus' call to follow him. You guys see that? It's convicting. There's no ideal season. There's no opportune moment where suddenly you will feel like, ah, now discipleship makes sense. (laughs) Now discipleship fits. It is designed to interrupt, to interfere, and crash land smack in the middle of your context, and that's the point. That's the point. Secondly, we should also be convicted to pause to see how we recognize and treat the call to discipleship. You see, back then, a rabbi's call, it was considered a great honor and privilege. Now, we don't have rabbis today, but again, one of the modern-day bales in our church and idols is the god of golf, okay? I bring this up all the time because I usually hear people talking about golf all the time. Imagine Tiger Woods, retired. He's like, I want to go to Grace Hill, <laughs> okay? The Tiger Woods comes to Grace Hill, and he's like, you know, my mission in life is I want to pick five disciples that I'm just going to train up to be the next PGA, you know, semi-pros. Now, wouldn't you be honored if he's like, after worship, I have an orientation, which if you went to that, you're being unfaithful because we have a CG orientation, okay? So that clearly shows your choice. But So you go to his orientation, he's like, I want you guys to all get your best gear, show your best swings, and I'm going to pick the five best among you. So you guys are all practicing, and then, you know, you go to the range, and he picks one of you, and say he picks you. What, what would you feel? Would you be like, honored? My goodness, Tiger Woods picked me out of everybody? Now imagine he doesn't just do that. He goes to you. He goes to your house. He knocks in your house. And you're in your like dirty clothes. Nothing's ready. Right? Your golf clubs are a mess. And he's like, I sought you out. Will you follow me? The honor. He didn't even have me go to him. He came to me. And yet, that's literally what Jesus does. Not just as rabbi, but as king of kings and lord of lords. But do we see it as a great honor and privilege? If I were to be honest, myself included, don't a lot of us treat Jesus' call as at best a burden and at worst like we're doing him a favor? Like, I guess. I guess I'll follow you, Jesus. I guess your kingdom could use a person like me. It's convicting. But even though it's convicting, it's even more comforting if you really think about it. Why? If Jesus had followed the traditional model of picking only the best of the best and only the most gifted people, only the Harvards of the world, then every moment of your life, would you not feel this pressure that, but I'm a San Diego Triton. I ain't a Harvard. I don't think I could ever be a Harvard. Or if you only pick people who had all this time and margin and money, and money at their disposal, wouldn't you feel like, but I don't have that kind of time. I don't have that kind of margin. So the call to discipleship then would understandably be out of touch with your reality. But the fact that Jesus goes out of his way to not only call disciples, but to call his very first disciples out of ordinary everyday fishermen right in the middle of their busyness shows Jesus intends to call you as you are, where you are. This means Jesus today through the word and the spirit, is looking at every single one of you in the audience that call yourself a Christian, and he sees you, busy parent, tired worker, discouraged young adult, struggling couple. He sees you personally in the midst of the busyness of your context, and he says, you right there as you are, follow me. I think, again, the challenge for many of us is we think there's this standard and expectation of giftedness or availability to meaningfully make a difference. You know what I love about Jesus' call? He never sets any sort of discipleship standard. He never sets a competition. He never says you need to be like this guy or that guy or this person or that situation. He doesn't compare you to anybody. You know why? He doesn't want you to be like this. All he says is, follow me. Like, you follow me. Don't worry about anyone or anything else. This call is between you and me. And I'm calling you in your context. You're not in their context. You see how personal that is? It's not this religious standard we're trying to meet. It's a relational call that he says, I see you. So that's the first truth. Follow me in the midst of where we are and who we are. Second truth, there is a great cost in following Jesus. There's a great cost. In our text, when Jesus sees two pairs of brothers fishing... 
He sees people, if I can describe their ethos, they are stuck in the status quo of the Jewish path of life that I described, which basically was, if you aren't gifted enough to be a Talmudim, and you don't make the cut, go back, live a kind of less than life of taking care of the family business, just being a good family man, and that's it. So you have to imagine, in one sense, they basically were kind of doomed to a life of this dull. We didn't make the cut. We're not the cream of the crop. So let's just kind of settle ourselves into this kind of living. And when Jesus sees them and the path that they are in, when he says, follow me, what he's essentially doing is he is calling them out of that status quo that they're so stuck in. And he's saying, I'm going to give you a different path. And that path is not a pattern of life. It is a person, Jesus. Get behind me, as we heard last week. And every call of discipleship, it is unmistakable. It comes with a cost. In the case of Simon and Andrew, the cost was great. Verse 20 says they left their nets. You know what that means? They left their business. They left their careers. They left their livelihood. It is a big cost. Even bigger cost. James and John left their father, Zebedee. You know what that would be like? It would be like if I took Ezra and Zachy fishing and we're in a boat and we're mending our nets and Ezra and Zach sees this guy. They're like, bye, Appa. And they just leave. I'd be like, what the heck? Like if I'm Zebedee, I'm like, what? And not just that. Leaving family network back then was absolutely a big deal. Okay, family was everything to them back then. But I also want to give some justice to this because the call to discipleship, it comes at a cost regardless. This is not unique to Jesus. All disciples in that culture were expected to make a significant sacrifice to devote themselves to a rabbi. So in other words, the stuff that seems so radical that these disciples are doing, every disciple would understand following means leaving family possibly, leaving community, setting aside personal ambitions, giving up independence. So again, the idea of the cost of discipleship, it's not unique to Jesus in the same way that today, when Jesus says there is a cost, it's not unique to him even today. Did you know you all pay for things that you are devoted to? You all pay a cost? Did you know there are some uh, developers who created apps simply to show you how many subscriptions you're paying for? I get bumps about that all the time. Did you know on average, a person without knowing is paying for 15 subscriptions on any given month? You're paying good money for these things. And you do it so mindlessly and blindly. Do you know how many paid subscriptions you have? Now, why do you pay for these things? Don't you pay for these things because you think it's going to enhance your life in some way? So like Spotify, Netflix, Gym classes, class pass, all of these things we know in a way, we pay a cost because if I do that, there's some sort of enhancement that I'm going to get. And you know you get what you pay for. You know how you know this? How many of you guys have tried the free trial version of these stuff? Do you know why these people give free trials? Unless you're kind of like the first-generation war-torn, like you don't mind ads every now and then. You're like, I came from the Korean War, so, you know, I could deal with a couple ads. Everybody else understands the reason they give you a free trial is because they know it's going to end up for you paying. Because it's frustrating. The free trial is not the fullest version of how you're going to experience these things. And yet, I hate to say, I wonder if a lot of us try to live in the realm of a free trial version of discipleship. Where you don't have to pay anything, but you kind of glean this marginal benefit That's what kind of Pastor Tom talked about last week. Jesus, he says there's the crowds and the disciples, but we've created this free trial gray zone, which is I'm a little bit of both. And here's what the text will tell us. The Bible is, if there's anything the Bible is clear on, it is this. There's no such thing. Jesus doesn't say, do you want to be an all-in disciple? Do you want to be a free trial disciple? Or do you want to be of the crowds? He says, you're either all in and you follow me or you don't. And last week, I encouraged you, decide which one you are because that's the starting point. Now, what's interesting, though, is if you journey through the Gospels and see how Jesus calls and interacts with his disciples, the most telling thing is the cost of discipleship, it's different for everybody. You see, these companies that charge you, there's a flat fee they charge you because what they want most is your money. So you pay for description, $30 across the board. And you think, is that how discipleship works? There's just this kind of universal cost that's supposed to be paid to follow Jesus. That's not how Jesus works. You know why? Because sometimes when he talks to a woman at the well, he starts pointing at her cost as being, you got to leave those husbands that aren't yours. He talks to a rich young ruler. He doesn't talk about husbands or wives. He says, you got to sell all that you have. 
Why is he pricking at these different costs of what it means to follow him? You know why? Because Jesus, he's about your heart. And he knows the cost to you is going to be that which you hold most precious. Not because he wants to ruin your life, because he knows it's ruining your life. And he says, if you're going to follow me, you've got to leave this behind. Now, what might that look like today? As mentioned, I've been thinking about this topic and message for a long, long time. In light of it being a vision series, I really thought like, how can discipleship be practical and not conceptual? I could have come up here and done the whole like fire and brimstone. So, so sell your stuff. <laughs> Go overseas. Be a fisher of men. And you might have been like, yeah. And then tomorrow it's like, so back to work. <laughs> you know I mean? like, and I was wrestling with the Lord. Like, I don't want that to be the case, God. How are we supposed to call this a vision series if you can't see it happening in your life? Then it's not a vision. It's a dream. It's a fairy tale. So I was like, we don't call this a daydream series. We call it a vision series. So I was like, God, help me to see it, right? Because if I don't see it, how are they supposed to see it? For me personally, the way I've been experiencing this in a real way has really been in everyday moments. As the Bible says, Jesus is no longer physically here on earth, but he's very much dwelling within you if you're a true Christian. That through the Spirit, Jesus dwells and resides within you. And I honestly think if you tease out this phrase, follow me, it applies to every sphere of life, from the big to the little. Let me illustrate this. One of the most humbling things that has happened in my life was becoming the father of two young, energetic boys. You know, I always thought myself and prided myself in being a calm and collected person. Like, I'm an Enneagram 9. We pride ourselves in, like, nothing phases us. Right? They always say Enneagram 9s were chameleons. We can be one through eight. We just don't know what we are, but it's all good because <laughs> we know what to be to keep the cool. Now, when these two boys enter my life, um, they push my buttons and unlock a level of, like, Bruce Banner, Hulk rage that I didn't think was possible for me, that I didn't know existed. And just know it's different for everybody what triggers you. It's very fascinating when you talk to parents. One thing triggers one parent, another thing triggers another parent. I Meaning it's actually not about what the kid's doing. It's about you. Something about what they're doing is telling you something about yourself. So one of my triggers is when my kids, if they behave in, misbehave in communal or public settings, something really, really bothers me. So they could do something like a level 3 out of 10 intensity, like they drop a spoon. And I'd be like, hey, <laughs> what are you doing? Totally disproportionate. You know what a 3 out of 10 response would be like? Don't drop the spoon, please. But why am I turning into the Hulk all of a sudden? And after reflecting, you know why? I realized it's because I hate the feeling of causing a disturbance and feeling embarrassed. And most likely it's because I was taught at an early age that I should follow a certain cultural standard. And if you don't know, I was, I was raised a PK. I was raised that you always got to be on your best behavior. So it's telling me a lot about myself, okay? So that's what I'm following. I'm following what I was told to follow. And as silly as it sounds, there was a, a past week in this moment, and I'm imperfect still, but there was a moment where they did something, and in my heart I genuinely felt just shy of audible that Jesus was saying, Sam, in this moment... Follow me. Which meant this. It meant there is a status quo path that you can go down right now where you get angry, the kids get affected, no one's happy. That is your well-trodden path of following that you've done. But Sam, if you follow me, here's the cost. you got to drop your pride. Isn't that an expensive cost? you got to drop your pride. you got to let go of this burden of shame that actually says more about you than it does about them. And you actually got to go down another path. And I'm giving you a choice. You don't have to stay in the status quo of following what you were always told. I'm giving you another path you could do, but it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you your pride. It's going to cost you your comfort level. It's going to cost you the joy of indulging in that anger. But here's the thing. Jesus, every time he says, follow me, almost every time he's saying there's a better way. There's a more loving way. There's a more fruitful way. It's not the easier way, but it's the better way. And even in a small moment like this, there is a cost to discipleship. If you're a parent or if you're anyone who has any sort of pride, pride is expensive. Laying down your pride is, the, is very, very not easy. But as we heard last week, the cost of not doing that and not following Jesus is so much greater. So much greater. If I didn't follow Jesus and I follow my natural instincts, I would indulge my anger 
but I'd hurt my relationship, I would hurt my witness, and I would even hurt my conscience in the long run. And I shared a seemingly insignificant example to make this point. Jesus' call to follow him has to permeate down to the smallest of situations, the smallest of thoughts, the smallest of emotions, the big and small of decision-making and issues of life, if you're ever to truly understand what it means to be his disciple. If you think following Jesus is limited to selling your stuff and going overseas on missions, which is great, but 99% of us aren't going to do that, you're always going to simply feel subpar as a follower, and you're always going to chalk it up to, well, that's out of touch my reality. So if I can give a very simple definition of how do we make sense of this phrase, follow me, I just came up with a very digestible way. Even this week, in your decision-making, in your struggles, in your parenting, in your whatever's going on, think to yourself, okay, Jesus in this moment, he's saying, follow me. What does he mean by that? Here's one way you think about it. He's saying, go where I go, do what I would do, love how I would love, and live how I would live. And I thought it was original to me, but I was like, this is basically WWJD. <laughs> My goodness, I'm not original at all. And maybe we need to revive that, right? We kind of put that on ice for a little bit because it became more about t-shirts and bracelets than the actual heart of it. But I think we're old enough to now say, is that not what discipleship is? What would Jesus do? I want to follow him. I want to lay down myself and bring him to life. So Jesus calls us as we are, where we are, and it comes with a cost, but why? What is he calling us into? Point number three, Jesus invites us to live for a greater purpose. Greater purpose. So imagine, and you might not have to imagine much, imagine you have lived your whole life accumulating wealth in the form of American dollars, currency. Because the dollar is powerful, right? Globally speaking, it's pretty powerful. And you've essentially placed your trust, whether you know it or not, in the strength of the currency of the American dollar. And if you really think about it, don't all of us do that? Because if you didn't believe the American dollar was trustworthy, wouldn't you get your money and like transfer it to like yen or pesos or something like that? But you don't. Why? Because you have this almost subconscious belief that the dollar is going to make it. The dollar is trustworthy. So we all do that. Now, imagine you heard from a trustworthy source, like a buffed up chat GPT or something. Say, like, hey, American dollar going to be okay? Da -da -da. I don't know, man. And it says, you know, 10 years from now, the American dollar is pretty much going to disappear as a legitimate currency. Just imagine that. I'm giving you a 10-year warning. How would you feel? For one, wouldn't you be forced to question the very purpose of how you're living? Like, really think about it. No one wants to say, I'm living for money, but you are. <laughs> like, 90% of your life is to make money, is to save, is to build assets, is to create wealth all in the form of the American dollar because you believe the strength of the American dollar. So if the American dollar is going to go away, you would be unwise to not question the very purpose of your life, that the very thing you've banked your whole life on is headed down a path of futility and worthlessness. And secondly, wouldn't you then be curious to ask, what asset can I trust? Where can I invest in then if the dollar's not going to cut it? What's going to last? Now, here's how you can assess if you just blindly built your trust in the life of the world. As I say that illustration, you're like, great hypothetical, Pastor Sam. But you scoff at it because you're like, but that'll never happen. I've never seen that happen in my life. How old are you? Like 35? Did you know in the scope of history that America as a nation is a dot? So for argument's sake, Let's say you, you, were, you were born in the Egyptian empire. Hundredfold the wealth, hundredfold the might and the scope of what America is today. And you said, I'm going to place my trust in the Egyptian currency. I'm going to place my trust in Pharaoh because he's unlike any other. Today you'd be broke. There is no Egyptian empire. There is no Pharaoh. So how wise are you really? So this is a loose picture of what Jesus' ministry was all about. Did you know that? Jesus' message and ministry was not less than forgiveness of sins, but I left verse 17 in there on purpose because the very start to Jesus' ministry was not, I'm here to forgive you, it's there is a kingdom that is coming. Look at verse 17. 
From that time when Jesus begins his ministry, he began to preach, repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, the entirety of Jesus' ministry and entrance into the world was a proclamation of a kingdom. There's a different type of king and a kingdom and kingdom life that I am inaugurating and ushering in. And it's only when you understand that and believe that, that the rest of the gospels make sense. For example, one small example is Matthew 6, verse 19, 20. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. He's giving you a dichotomy of a kingdom that is fleeting and a kingdom that is coming. There are hundreds and hundreds of verses like this. He's painting a picture for you. This world that you think is going to be here forever, it's going away. And the world you're getting to live for with spiritual eyes to see that I'm inaugurating as the king that is spiritual in nature now, but will be literal in, in the future, that's the kingdom to come. I'm giving you an early investment. I'm giving you an option to join in. So one thing is clear. In the economy of God's kingdom, to put it simply, material wealth is ultimately seen as worthless. Ultimately. Now we need it. We need it to be surviving. We need it to be good stewards over. But in value sense, it is ultimately worthless. So it should make you at least pause and think, why do I work so hard for this thing that the scriptures are saying is ultimately worthless to just make more money, to get more stuff, to accumulate assets, which is actually more the American dream. It's not the Christian dream. You see, the same was the case for the disciples. They were fishermen. Why were they fishermen? To catch fish. Why do they catch fish? To make money and make a living. So the question then is, how does Jesus invite them into a new purpose without totally derailing your life? Because again, like I said, my understanding was, if I'm a teacher, Jesus says, follow me, go on missions. If I'm a bank worker, follow me, go on missions. That's just, that was my black and white, so vanilla understanding of discipleship that I just drop everything, erase myself, and like, okay, I'm, I'm like one of the disciples now. That's just not what's going on here. I have to unpack this because verse 19, read it. He said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I'm sure many of us have heard this verse and phrase preached as, therefore, evangelize. Go to the nations. Now, don't get me wrong. 100% is saying that. Okay? It's not less than that. But I think there's so much more going on here. For one, notice Jesus He is not erasing or bypassing their identity as fishermen. Did you ever ask that? He could have said, you're fishermen? Okay, we'll give that up now. Now you're going to be something else. Because I want you to make a clean cut. Why is Jesus saying, in my asking you to follow me, I'm going to contextualize it to your current occupation? Have you ever thought about that? You know why? Because Jesus, he doesn't erase your identity. He repurposes it. He repurposes it. If you don't know what repurposing means, a simple definition, it means to imaginatively transform something to give it new functionality or value. Here's what I mean by that. So say there's this thing that's worthless, junk, item, no good, be thrown away in 99% of people's eyes. To repurpose it means someone sees in a way that nobody else sees, this is a valuable thing if you just tweak it a little bit and give it new purpose. That's what it means to repurpose. That's what Jesus is doing here. I like the simple quote that says, Fisher of men was a play on words. God turned their vocation into a calling. And what is this greater purpose that Jesus invites not just those disciples, but all disciples into? It is the economy of the kingdom. Live for not stuff. Live for people. People. In the economy of the world, The greatest asset and value is material wealth. And if I can put it this way, the king of that kingdom is you. Do you trust yourself to be king? Because that's what it is. You're the king. In the kingdom of God, his economy, the greatest value are the souls of people. And Jesus is king. Which one do you want to be in? How do we know that that's the case? Last week we heard. What does it benefit to gain the whole world The world's economy, yet forfeit a soul. The king's economy. Heaven rejoices over one soul that repents. Kingdom economy. Now this has massive implications because I'm sure a lot of us are stuck in a life that can only be defined as kind of a low-level discontentment 
and an overall mediocrity. Now, if you're one of the ones that are like, I love life, like, you're, you're rare. Because most people I talk to, I've never seen anyone that says, like, I totally love the way my life is going. Everything is exactly how it hoped. I feel so satisfied. I feel so joyful. Nobody, everyone's kind of a low-level discontentment. Things that they wish happened didn't really happen. And so you're just kind of trudging along in this mediocre life that you feel like you're just status quo stuck in. And the temptation for a lot of us is to think, you know what I need? I need a change, external change. Maybe I got to move out of country. Maybe I got to change up my scenery. Maybe I got to make more money. Maybe I need a better job. Maybe I need to be in a better relationship. And that's where your thoughts get dark, don't they? Maybe I made a wrong decision. Maybe I'm with the wrong person. Jesus, the pattern of how he transforms your life is he does not change circumstances. He changes you. Transformation is about you. Now, what might this look like? If you're a college student, maybe you're thinking, so what impact could I possibly make in this college life stage? I don't have much money. I'm just a student. Maybe Jesus would repurpose your paradigm and say, in your studies, in the time and energy you have, live for people. Make that your aim and goal. Study for the aim of reaching people. Not for grades, not for accolades, but for people. If you're working out and you think, I'm just stuck in this job that I don't really like, Jobs to jobs, I'm just waiting for my vacation. Is that not a sad reality that 80% of your life is you're stuck in this thing that you hate? And Jesus repurposes that. Well, maybe your job's not just a job. Maybe there's missed opportunities. Maybe there's a new purpose that you have not even asked to see where you can be a blessing and witness for the sake of people. And this one is more pointed. As for parents, because it's so visceral to me, can I give a more pointed challenge here? And I speak to myself. Again, Jesus starts his ministry by saying, I'll make you fishers of men. And he ends his ministry with the Gay Commission saying, make disciples of all nations. So those are the bookends of Jesus' ministry. Be about others. Follow me so that they may follow you to follow me. That's really the heart of what discipleship is. Do you realize as a parent, because I get it, parents, we're busy, we're tired. We barely have time to interact with people. But you know who you interact with all the time? Your children. Did you know, in a sense, you are a missionary, in a sense, because your children are lost. Do you realize that? They are in need of Jesus. And they may not quite understand following Jesus, but they're following you, whether you like it or not. Are you leading your children with the worldly following path of career, wealth, cultural conformity, more than tending to their soul to see a greater kingdom praying for their salvation. Now imagine your children at the end of their journey. What is the greatest goal that you have for their life? Is it when they put on a white coat to become a doctor and you feel beaming with joy and pride? Is it if they're married with a kid and just have a happy family that you're like, ah, oh, I feel so good? Or they have a strong generational financial savings that you've helped them create and you're like, they're going to be okay. You know, we had a ministry leaders weekend there not too long ago, and we were going around sharing kind of, as ministry leaders, we serve, 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 but like, why do we serve? Like, why do we do this? And we were going around, and one of the sisters, I'll, I'll name drop her, you guys know her, so Gia, mom of two, Gia was sharing, and then all of a sudden, she was like, you know, do you know why I do it? And then she was like, oh, like, I don't know her. She started choking up. We're like, huh? Is there like dust in the air or something? And she's like, I'm sorry. And then we're like, why? She's like, as I was thinking about my why, she started choking up. She's like, oh, it's because I was imagining Theo and Abby in heaven. And then she started choking up. And you know what else happened? Everybody else started choking up. You know why? Because if you're a true Christian, that calibrates your soul. That's what it's about. And in case you might be thinking, I don't have the capacity, though, to make this kind of transformation. I'm burnt out. I don't even know how to go about it. Notice Jesus never left it up to you to figure it out. He never said, all right, now follow me, but figure out how to be a blessing or follow these steps to be successful. He says, follow me and I will do it. I will make you fishers of men. I will repurpose your life. I got you. Just trust me. If you truly count the cost and follow me, at the other end of that is a promise that I will take responsibility for a greater purpose to live for. I will transform your heart through the Spirit to see things through the kingdom lens. 
You simply follow me. I love how one commentator puts it. He says, we were found to find others, saved to save others. And you may say, I can't do that, but it is not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. God would supernaturally enable them to do what they could not do on their own because Jesus said, I will make you. It is not information that we need, but transformation. And I have to include this because I believe it's so important. And I guess my will is, I hope you realize that at the other end of the great cost of discipleship is not just a greater purpose, it is a greater reward. The Bible is not silent about the fact that a, a life lived for Jesus is the greatest investment you can make. So in Mark 10, Peter's like us. Peter's like, Jesus, like, we left everything and followed you. And you know what Jesus says? Jesus said, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or field for my sake and for the sake of the gospel who will not receive a hundred times more now at this time. Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields of persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. But many who are first will be last and the last first. If you are vying to be the cream of the crop in the world's eyes, there's a very possible chance in the kingdom you're last. Because kingdom is upside down to the world. It's literally flipped. But if you humble yourself, live a life of giving rather than hoarding, living a life to be a blessing, Jesus says, oh, there's a payoff. And the payoff is great. And I hope you realize discipleship is quintessential because you don't teleport to heaven. That's how a lot of us treat Christianity. I'm good now, so I'm going to live my worldly life, and then boom, I end up in heaven one day. That's not the gospel. The gospel is heaven is here. You are kingdom heavenly citizens now. Live in such a way that reflects that. That's true to your true citizenship. That you follow a different set of ethics, you follow a different set of standards, you have a different economy altogether, and your currency is relational, not material. And that is what gets people to say, if it's fishing analogy, what is that? What is that thing? Even your own children. What is that thing that my parents seem to act so differently than other parents? In other words, being a fisher of men, it's not a duty, it's an identity. It's who you are. Who you are is salt. Who you are is light. When you try to make it a task, you can't do it because you don't even believe in it. No one's going to believe something that you don't believe. We have to understand that. So how does that tie back to our vision? Quick closing here. That's why this vision series is about raising the bar. The first thing is community groups. There's an orientation right after worship, so I'm not going to say too much here. But we're shifting the focus of our community groups, not just to be for connection, even though that's great, but to learn and grow together. And can I exhort you? Can you really try to put a high value and priority, not just for your sake, but for the sake of the community in community group? Not because community group is this glorious thing, but it is a means and it is an avenue for you to practice discipleship. And you know what's fascinating? The word disciple, it's always used in the context of community in the New Testament. He says, disciples, Follow me together. You are entered into community. In other words, discipleship, you just being in community with other Christians by nature is discipleship. Do you see it that way? And it comes at a cost. But for one night a week, for two hours, if the cost is for the purpose of growing closer to Jesus, I hope you would consider it. Second is courses. So we're going to introduce this soon. If a disciple at its core means to follow Jesus, I think it's important to know, number one, who Jesus really is, but more importantly, to tune our minds, to tune our hearts, to tune our ears, to know what he sounds like, no? Like, Jesus could be speaking to all you want, but if you don't even know what he sounds like, if you don't even know WWJD, what he would do in that moment, how are you going to follow him? That's what Courses is about. It's about equipping teaching, grounding us to have a space to grow in who this is, grow in what that looks like in a variety and a scope of everyday life so that you can understand what that means to follow him. And third and last is membership. Like I said, it's telling that it's very rare to see the term disciple in singular form. It's because from the very beginning, he intended his disciples to be in loving and clear community. So that elders just know our worst fear is if membership devolves to a formality or like a nice roster on paper that has no functional meaning or value. So what does that mean? It means we may push the envelope. We're not doing this because we think we're macho Christians. We're not doing this to make your life miserable. We're doing this because we want to push you towards following Jesus. And that's the kind of church we hope to be. And this vision is accomplished not by the elders, but by the people of God. 
And again, lastly, I hope that you're reminded Jesus has been and is seeking you out today. I know some of you personally, I know you're feeling distant, guilty, or dirty from sin or at the brink of giving up. My heart really does go out to you that can you be reminded, Jesus, he's not, he's not a program. He's not a to-do list. He's a savior, healer, redeemer. And if I can use today's language, he's a great repurposer. That situation, that relationship, that hurt that you think is irreparable, he can repurpose it. He won't erase it and act like it never happened or you're not in the monk, the, the gunk that you're in. But if he can repurpose death itself, right? Death, the greatest enemy, unavoidable. We all dread it. And he turns it into the greatest joy. To, to die is gain. If he can repurpose death itself, whatever situation you feel like is dead, oh, he can repurpose that with the resurrection power of Christ. Let's pray together.